Hey, it's Ivan from the EV Stock Channel here, and today I've got a special guest, Jordan Gieski from The Limiting Factor, to discuss all things batteries. So, Jordan, first of all, how are you doing? I'm doing well, thanks. Thanks for having me on again. Ah, you're very welcome. So, uh, Jordan, let's just get straight into things. And my first question for you is, what are you expecting to be announced on Battery Day? Probably the best place to start is uh, with like watt hour per kg figures. That's yep. something pe people are familiar with and they can relate to. Yep. I would say for the legacy chemistry, which is the 18650 and 2170 yep. cells that their Tesla is current using currently, it would yep. be um, between 280 and 300. And for whatever advanced or new cell or form factor that they have, uh, well in excess of that potentially. I, I'm hoping for 320 to 330. Okay. Um, so within two to three years, how much production do you see Tesla achieving? Um, that's a good question. Uh, and I'm assuming the reason why you're asking this is because Elon yesterday on the earnings call mentioned terawatt scale factories. Based on the information I've seen, I could see a potential that level of increase. Uh, because the Maxwell dry electrode technology is able to spit electrode material out much faster. I pulled my predictions back quite a bit. I was expecting maybe a 50% increase or a, a doubling of their production output. But going from 150 gigawatt hours to a terawatt is, you know, six or seven, six or seven X. Um, hmm. What about if they do switch to the DBE method and they could eliminate, eliminate the drying ovens? How much extra space would that free up? And then how much, like, what would be the density of output in that factory? Like, could it turn the gigafactory into a terafactory? That's, that's a good that question. Out? It's something I've, uh, I haven't had a chance to sit down and calculate yet. The issue is, is there's so many different factors at play here that yeah. it's really hard to pin down. Um, but what I can do is I can bring up an image of... Sure. Uh, what uh, proportionally how much space in the factory each one of these things takes up. Sure. Okay, so is that showing for you? Yes, it is. Okay, so as you can see, there's the electrode materials and electrode coating and evaporation and solvent recovery. All yeah. that is uh, the area that Maxwell's tech is going to take up. And that'll be shrunk down to about oh, about half the size of this section here. So okay. it does remove a considerable proportion. I don't know, maybe 10%. Uh, we're looking at multiples rather than uh, percentages here. Uh, one terawatt is just absolutely massive. I'll just stop sharing my screen. Yeah, no problem. Perfect. And what were your thoughts on the conference call? Did you get any, any new ideas? Uh, the big takeaway for me was the, the terawatt factory thing. Uh, it got me to thinking maybe I should make a video on it. It was also interesting that Elon said it would be one of the most significant days in the, the company's histories. And I, I totally, um, I totally agree based on the little pieces of information that I've picked up. I actually just yeah. tweeted a few minutes ago that this is going to be the day that Tesla fully reveals their end game because we've always known what it is, but we've never mm -hmm. known this, um, We've never known what the machine is going to be that delivers us those multi terawatt numbers. And that's yep. what they're going to be showing us, which is absolutely cool. Yeah, definitely. Well, it was interesting. They were talking about having not as many factories, but trying to consolidate factories and trying to have as much vertical integration under one roof as possible. So I am thinking few massive factories as opposed to many dispersed factories. If they can do it, that would be the way to go. Just have like um, one terawatt of production for each, yep. I don't know, let's say, I'm just pulling numbers out of there, one terawatt yeah. for each uh, billion people yep. in the world, 10 terafactories would have you covered. And about yep. 10 terafactories is kind of a minimum number for what we're going to need in 2030. Yeah. And then, go ahead. Oh, well, I was actually just going to ask you, I've seen a lot of the research that you've been doing on battery technology. Mm -hmm. And 
I assume most people would, would associate all this new battery technology to the automotive um, segment. But do you think any of this new technology, Maxwell technology, is going to be going into, say, home storage, the power walls, power packs, anything like that? I, I'm of two minds about that. There's probably the best use in the near term for the technology is automotive. Um, but it, it, what, the, what Tesla has done is there's usually a spider diagram for each type of battery chemistry. And you have to choose different chemistries depending on which area of that spider chart you want to hit. Energy yep. density, cycle life, etc. Well, what yep. they're, it looks like they're going to be able to do is expand the spider chart in all directions. So they might yep. have one chemistry that works for everything. If not, then... I don't see why they can't keep scaling with Panasonic and uh, Tesla can scale their lines at the same time that Panasonic is scaling theirs. Um, you know, go two fisted yep. approach. Yeah. Okay. That would be interesting. Mm. Another question. Uh, when it comes time for them to start implementing a recycling process, do you think mm -hmm. that they're going to start recycling and then maybe using the recycled batteries into Tesla energy? I need to look further into what quality of materials they're able to pull out of that recycling process, because I think some of the recycled materials that come out of the process aren't extremely high grade. And for batteries, you need super high grade materials. So I think uh, part of it is just going to be offloaded onto the market. Um, but some of the materials, hopefully lithium, and uh, they'd be able to recycle back in the batteries. Um, yep. But I don't know. It's something I need to look into still. Yep. Another question for you. Um, in one of your previous videos, you were talking about Scylla nanotechnologies, and you mm. talked about them having a cathode, which I was completely unaware of. Um, so I was just wondering if you can just shed some light on that topic, because it would be very interesting to me if, if a company that's making next-generation anodes are also working on the cathodes. Uh, yeah, I kind of stumbled into that by accident because yeah. when I saw the silent nanotechnologies at the top, I just grabbed the image and I used yep. it uh, for, and I'm, I applied it to their anode. Then I realized after I, after I made the video that it was actually a cathode product. And then um, I did a quick Google search and I couldn't find any refer other reference material to a, a silo cathode. So I think... Um, there's no other information on it that I can find, but it looks okay. like potentially Scylla is maybe broadening beyond just the anode into um, a battery materials company, and they'll have multiple products, which is similar to what Nano One is doing. They're yeah. uh, hedging their bets in multiple places rather than okay. you know all rather than all the eggs in one basket. Uh, also, you're able to talk more about the chemistry that Tesla's using, I think, the iron phosphate batteries? Yeah, for the the batteries that they're getting from CATL, the, the lithium yep. iron phosphate ones, it's actually an underrated chemistry and a relatively new chemistry on the scene. I think it was developed in the late 90s or something like that, and uh, yep. it was one of the fastest chemistries ever, ever, ever from lab to market. Um, and there was an op open patent on it, uh, and China took advantage of that, yep. and for good reason. It's one thing that needs to be debunked is you often see these breakthrough chemistries that come out, uh, and those breakthrough chemistries, they'll be using fancy materials in them, and those would be extremely high cost, like precious metals, etc. Um, those are never going to fly. In order to uh, release a battery chemistry that's actually going to have an impact on the world, you yep. have to have enormous amounts of bulk material available. So lithium, iron, phosphate is just, you know, easy to access, access those materials. And then even though it's low energy density, it's cheap and it's super yep. long life and high power density. Okay. So with that in mind, what are your thoughts on Samsung's uh, new report? <laughs> well, this is kind of what I was alluding to before about yeah. the, the precious metals and batteries. Um, they put silver in it. You don't put <laughs> silver in a battery if you're going to be making millions, literally millions of battery cells a day. 
That's yeah. it's, that's not how you shift the world to sustainable energy. So I, I found it, it was telling that one of the researchers who worked on that, um, when asked about what this could be used for, when it uh, when they intend for it to be implemented, his uh, his response was very political and very uh, management speak. He said, yeah. "We see we view this as a seed technology for future technologies." <laughs> So basically he's saying we don't see any use for this. We just made it because we thought it was cool and would get yeah. headlines. So, hmm. yeah. Another thing that I noticed in your videos was you were talking about voltages. Mm. And I was just wondering, have voltages changed over time throughout Tesla skin um, battery cells? As far as I'm aware, they haven't. I did, did a little bit of looking into the Roadster and the... I couldn't find the specific chemistry that it actually uses. There's a couple different chemistries that people floated for it. But regardless, um, a typical lithium ion battery has a voltage range from 3 volts to 4.2 volts. And interestingly yep. enough, that's the same, same across the different chemistries. Okay. And are you anticipating the new battery technology to have higher voltage? Yes. And the reason that's possible uh, the limitation isn't um well there's multiple limitations there but uh, i expect tesla to increase it by 0.1 volt to 4.3 volts which is an 8.3 percent energy density increase uh, and the reason why that's possible is because um jeff don's lab which is tesla's research partner has yep. done a lot of digging into what makes batteries uh fully fall apart and fail. And with Tesla's new materials and uh, electrolyte mixtures, they can crank that voltage up higher without the battery falling apart. Okay. Mm. Well, in one of the other videos, I thought it was really interesting how you're talking about Colum columbic efficiencies and how they can sort of test for shelf life. Um, I was wondering if you can just give, you know, talk about that a bit more, because I think that is really an underrated part of what Tesla could do in terms of speeding up their research. Yeah. Um, Coulombic efficiency is where it's all at. And uh, if you understand why a battery fails, you can improve it on every front. Um, and what Coulombic efficiency is, is the difference between the amount of energy you put into a battery and the amount of energy you get out. The more efficient it is, um, the longer life the battery will be. And the reason for that is if you have inefficiencies, that means there's reactions happening in the battery that should not be happening. And that energy is going to make the battery uh, fall apart rather yep. than into actually being used. How much work needs to be done on electrolytes if you're changing voltages? The electrolyte is actually a mix of different things. It's yep. There's an, uh, a solvent which is kind of like, you can consider that like water. And then there's yeah. the electrolyte salts, which you can consider that like a salt. And that's the, the primary solution in an electrolyte. Now, yeah. there's also other things that you put in there called additives. And what the additives do is um, the first time that you cycle a cell, it uh, creates a protective coating on the cathode and anode. Uh, so they'll last a lot longer. So okay. uh, there's thousands. Um, well, Jeff Don put it best. He said that uh, if you want to know what uh, chemicals could be used in a battery, uh, open up a book of chemicals and any of those <laughs> is a potential a chemical that you could use. Yeah. And that's what they've been doing. They've been sorting through thousands and thousands of um, chemicals um, just to narrow down which ones they should test. And after they, they worked out which ones they should test, they then have to test them and that takes years. Mm -hmm. And what are your thoughts on solid state batteries after doing all your research? Um, it's mostly BS. <laughs> I mean, at, at the current point in time, anything that you see about solid state batteries is uh, I immediately um, dismiss. The reason for that is, and I have to verify this, but I don't think any battery chemistry has ever come from an independent com uh, company before or a privately held company. All these uh, battery technologies that we've ever had have come from yeah. uh, collaboration between multiple universities over years and years and years. They're complex problems. So, yeah, there are companies that reach out and they might uh, create a solid state technology that 
does work just fine, but it won't have that nice, perfect uh, spider chart where it's good at everything. Okay. And it might be good at energy density or cycle life, et cetera. Um, but what the universities are focused on is a global solution that is better than anything else on the market. And uh, although it's going to take them longer to get there, I think it'll be a better product. And maybe just before we finish up, I was just wondering if you could maybe talk a bit about your channel, sort of what you cover. Yeah, so my channel is called The Limiting Factor. And the whole idea behind it was uh, that any technology encounters limiting factors and getting through those limiting factors is, uh, you know, key if you want to commercialize a technology and make it actually real for people rather than science and science fiction. Um I've mainly been focused on batteries and battery investor day and batteries are going to keep me busy for a while because the more yeah. I learn about them, the more I realize, um, I have a lot more to learn. Um, and yeah. what I'm going to be focused on the next couple of months, probably besides battery day is focusing on, um, building basic knowledge about what makes a viable battery chemistry or viable battery product and uh yep. what doesn't so people when they're watching the news can uh they can have a good bs detector and decide yep. for themselves whether something is actually actually viable or not the the telltale signs of what to look for okay no that that sounds pretty good hmm. so well again i just wanted to say you know thank you for coming on to the show um I learn a bunch of stuff. I mean, I've got like another 400 questions, but I, I think I need some time to sort of process everything that you just mentioned during this yeah. conversation. And I'll make sure to have a bunch of questions lined up for our next interview. And I'm sure there'll be questions coming in from, from our viewers and subscribers. So mm. we'll, we'll have a lot to discuss, I'm sure. Yeah, sounds good. We'll see, we'll see how this goes, see how people, uh, see if people enjoy it. Yeah, definitely. All right. No worries, all right. Cool. All right, well, thanks again, Jordan, and yeah, I'll see you soon. Yeah, catch you later. Okay, so I hope you guys enjoyed this episode, and let me know if you guys would like to see these sort of interviews with Jordan on a regular basis. If so, and you guys have some sort of questions, shoot them through, and I'll bring them up with Jordan in the next episode. Till next time, I'll see you guys soon.